Hey guys, Jennifer Hobbs here with Celebrate the Struggle, where I really want for us to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and have conversations that may not feel good or be pretty, but in the end, we've persevered and got to this point. And today, I have the pleasure of being with a fellow battle buddy that I served with, Casey Pinnell. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, pleasure is all mine. Um, it's it's a it's a cool thing. I've never podcasted before, so this is a this is a treat for me. Uh, I'm excited to do it. Oh, and I'm so lucky that I'm your first one. I may not be your last one. Look at that, big well, timer. You hope you hope we just keep growing, right? Hopefully, everybody wants to wants to talk to me at some point. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So tell us, right. like, what? Wh tell us more about Casey Pinnell, Where you come from? you know, whatever you want to tell us so that we know just who you are. Um, well, uh, currently, um, I teach uh, K-1-2 PE at Washington Elementary School in Robinson. Um, I'm also the head football coach here for Robinson High School, so, so I get the opportunity um, to work daily with, with student athletes um, in the school of Robinson High School. Um, and in an aspect of uh, physical and emotional and uh, mental growth, uh, which is a, a treat and a joy. And, and, I'm, and um, how I got here is, is inexplicable to me. I have no idea um, how we got to this point, but um, pretty cool uh, regardless. Um, I also get to work every day with a bunch of little kids. Um, and if you remember kindergarten, first, second grade PE, you love everything. So uh, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a joy um, to, to work in that atmosphere. And, and we get to work with some really cool kids every single day um, who, who enjoy me being there and love coming to PE. And so it's a, it's a really rewarding job. Um, uh, how, how I got here. Um, do we just dive right into that? Just go, go. for it. Yeah. You dive. Just go for it. Um, so, so, so background story. Um, I've, I've had a, a, a multitude of experiences growing up. Um, my parents were, were separated at an early age, which is not overly uncommon. Um, but um, I, I lived with my mom growing up, um, and my father was a uh, every other weekend type guy, as again, is the story is, is pretty common. Um, so it, it kind of went that way up until the fifth grade, and my mom got married to a Haitian, um, and she was a missionary and moved to the country of Haiti. And, and um, I went with her there for a year um, wow. to Haiti. Um, so I spent my fifth grade year there in the country of Haiti and, and what an unbelievable experience um, that was obviously a very impoverished nation. Um, and my mom and my stepdad did a lot of amazing things there for the people. And so I got to be a part of that for a year. Um, as the year went on, um, at the ripe old age of 12, um, I decided that, that that experience was not for me, um, and and my mom was um, accepting of that, and she allowed me to move back to the United States with my father, and so sixth grade, I moved back with my dad. Um, we had some trials and tribulations as it went on, and over the course of um, three years, through my junior high years, um, you know, some things had happened where we had, we had lost some stuff uh, financially. Um, and, and my father and I never had the best relationship during that time. And, and there was some, some potential drug abuse and, and some things like that. And so my father ended up leaving Paris. And, and so I had gone to six different schools before the fifth grade. And um, I had lived in Paris for three years. And I decided that I didn't want to go. It was the first time that I felt like I had had a home. First time I'd had friends um, for longer than a period of a year um, and kind of had established myself there and, and wanted to stay. And so when my father left, I moved in with my grandma. Um, my grandma was not in great health. She was a smoker, um, as that generation was. I think everybody was, was a smoker then, right? And um, she was in not in great health, um, and she was trying to raise a teenage kid. And so um, during that time, um, I kind of took advantage of that situation um, in, in, in an unhealthy way. And so um, I chose the feeling of, of acceptance. Um, in whatever way that I could find it. And that was through um, partying, um, drug use, alcohol abuse through high school. So um, that continued um, until my senior year of high school, my grandma passed away. So in October of 02, 
my grandma had passed away and we lived in income-based housing. Well, I was 18 and I was an occupant on, on the house. And so when my grandma passed away, the, the people that ran the income-based housing basically walked in and said, hey, you're 18. You're on the list as an occupant of this house. The house is yours. So, so I was an 18 year old in high school and now I lived by myself. My mom was still living in Haiti. Um, my dad was out of the picture. We hadn't spoken in a couple of years. My grandma had just passed away. And so it was just, it was just me in this house. Um, stayed there for about a month by myself. Um, and all I really had to do was keep the lights on and, and the water on. Those were the only two bills we had. So I kind of worked a part-time job. Um, really kind of found my niche in sports. Um, and, and I don't know that I was a phenomenal athlete, but what I did embrace was the relationship part of the extracurricular activity of sports. Um, I had friends, I had people that had common interests as, as I did. I had people that wanted to be at the same place as I did. And um, over the course of my life, that feeling of acceptance mm -hmm. was lost. And so when, whenever I found that, whenever I found sports and whenever I found that camaraderie through that, I embraced it and, and it became, um, came by crutch right it became the one place that I had that was normal um and so so you know with me going through everything that that I had gone through and and that feeling of loneliness because my, my parents weren't necessarily around um and then I was alone essentially my senior year living by myself um, um the sports was kind of my crutch um and I really really embraced that team mentality um mm -hmm. and again not making great decisions, I knew I needed an out. And so um, the military was it for me. I don't know how hard the recruiter had to pitch, but he had me the time, I mean, from the time we sat down at the table. And, right. um, and then he's like, you know, one weekend a month, two weeks out of the summer, we'll pay for your school, we'll give you money while you're in school, you're getting money while you go to these drill weekends. And I'm just thinking to myself as a 18 year old kid living by himself, like, why doesn't everybody do this? Like, what, what an right. amazing deal, right? So we joined, um, and, and, you know, at that time I knew there was no ultimate team other than the United States military. And, and that was, um, that was everything to me, the team, um, that was all I had. And so what I thought I, that was all I had. Right. Um, and so, um, joined the military, graduated high school. Um, obviously, uh, probably a similar story for you. We were all young pups. We went overseas, right? Graduated mm -hmm. high school, went to basic training, got out of uh, AIT, went straight through with my schooling and stuff. Um, I think I graduated in the middle of October and then early November, we got activated. And, um, you know, February 04, um, we're in Iraq, right? Yeah. You know, we're landing in, in Kuwait and ready to do this thing for a year. Um, so, we got back from overseas, um, dabbled with some college stuff, was not real good at it, still didn't know how to be an adult, had no clue. Right. I had multiple experiences oh my in my life. Right, yeah. And I, I mean, I think, um, you know, we were young. Gosh, we were kids. We went overseas, all of us. Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple old cats sprinkled in the unit, but most of us were just puppies and just figuring this out. Um, and I did not have that that parental structure when I returned. So when I returned back from overseas, here's this young kid who was stuck in the gutter when I left, just trying to figure out life on my own. And then they dropped me back into real life um, with money. Like I had saved up some money and now they're right. just dropping me into a college atmosphere. And here I am 19, 20 years old um, with 25 grand in the bank. Um, it, it didn't go well. Like, I, bet. I, would, I know, I it bet. It didn't go well. Right. It didn't like, go goodbye, well, so. 25 grand. Goodbye. I mean, if it's anything yeah. like my life, like your dignity, like you just lose yourself. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so, I mean, I think when we were overseas, um, there was that continued um, embracing of the team atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that was apparent. Um, everything that we were going through overseas, we, we went through it together. Yeah. All of us um, as a big group, as a big team. And like I said, when I was in high school, that was the one thing that got me by. And so once we returned and I had all this stuff, my, I think my struggle was that that was gone. Um, that day to day of waking up and embracing something as a whole, as a group, as a unit um, was gone. And so now I was back in the real world by myself. Um, we did not have that parental support necessarily um, that was present. Um, you know, I think mom was always a phone call away. Um, but you know, sure. But no one like 
pushing you, like being like no one to be accountable for, like you have to be accountable for yourself. And like, when you don't know yourself and you're that young and like for, I, I get those feelings. Like I wanted this back. I wanted every day, like with those relationships, I wanted that back. And then being without that, it was like, what? Sure. Yeah. And the structure, right. The structure Mm -hmm. was something that I never had had and until, you know, I would go to practice every day and practices were structured. And there was a group of people that were going through that same structure and that same accountability set of rules together. Um, same thing with the military, there was structure and every day was to a degree planned for you, right? There was no, there was no wiggle room. You knew what you were doing and you knew that there was people around you that were going to do it with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we got back, right, that's, that was all gone. It was all gone. And so, um, you know, dipped right back into um, the alcohol abuse right after we got back, as, as many of us probably did. Um, again, young, trying to trying to catch up for the two years that I had missed while we were overseas, um, trying to reform those relationships with friends that had been gone while I was overseas. Um, and and man, I chased that through partying, right, through, through yeah. some alcohol abuse and stuff like that. And then um, the, the real savior um, for me was um, my wife. Um, so when, 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 when we first started dating again, it was rocky. We kept breaking up. I kept choosing this, this lifestyle that was not conducive to um, <clears throat> anything other than selfishness. So like how long um, ago after the um, deployment when we returned? So we returned in March. 2005 about about yeah. what time were things getting rocky with you and well you're now wife? we got we got married in 2010 um so we started dating really shortly after um we got back so probably 2006 is when we started dating we dated for about four years we'd been friends in high school and we'd stayed in touch while we we're overseas and and so we always have been close friends um and then we got into the relationship and it went you know, really well for, for a while. And then, um, you know, my focus was not the relationship. I still was trying to catch up for all those times that I had missed with my friends. I was still looking for that big group structure, um, that I never found. Um, and, and really I had never taken any time whatsoever to think about what I was really doing to myself or to the people that were investing time into me and, and um, just being selfish and chasing that stuff. And so that, that kind of led into some, some fighting between her and I and a relationship got rocky. And then um, <clears throat> we'd break up, get back together, break up, get back together. It was like a junior high story. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I dropped out of college um, and, and my wife, Sarah, and I were, were still still off and on at the time, but I had dropped out of college and was working some jobs and then was doing some bartending and um, <clears throat> found a couple um, factory jobs that were, you know, whatever. You just wake up, go to work, right? Wake up, go to work, wake up, go to work. Um, and it was never it. Like, it never felt right. I never felt like I was the true part of, of that team. And then um, about 2000, and um lord have mercy eight or nine um there was a new guy that moved into paris and his name was creighton tar and and he was became the head baseball coach and i had played baseball in high school and i was just looking for something and so i asked him i said hey can i just come help coach like i i've got nothing to offer um i've got basic (laughs) baseball fundamentals like I, i don't never coached before i've never done this um but i just need to be a part of something um, and he's like, yeah, come on, let's go. And so um, he allowed me to step onto the staff and be a part of what they were doing um, on the baseball team. And it was, it was instant. It was almost instant. Like the very first day of practice when it was over with, like I couldn't, I couldn't grasp what had just happened. Like there it was, there was the structure and there was the team camaraderie and there was being a part of something that was, was, was bigger than myself. Right. And, and I had the opportunity to work underneath Creighton, who was an, he's an unbelievable baseball coach. He's a great guy. Um, our, our, we're really close friends now and he's the godson or sorry, the godfather of my son. Um, and that relationship developed, but um, 
it was almost like day one, I had found something that felt right. And it felt like that was, um, to me, where I needed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I realized that I had, um, I had somebody in my corner that was helping me fight. And, and it, was, it was my wife. And so sometime around um, then 2008, I decided, hey, I got to take a second here and, and regroup right? Like I can't keep living life like this. I can't keep bouncing from job to job. Um, I can't keep hurting the people that are trying to invest time in me and are still there for whatever God awful reason. She decided that she was still going to hang out with me during all this time of me trying to figure out who I was. Um, she was still there and, um, it all kind of clicked. It all kind of clicked at that day. And so I decided, Hey, I'm going to invest my time into this. And, and I knew through experiences that I've had living overseas, being in the military, um, the struggles um, in high school, um, the struggles with life choices after we got back. I knew all of this gave me an opportunity to be able to relate to a lot of people on a lot of different mm-hmm. levels. And I knew that um, through coaching, I would have the opportunity to give back. I would have the opportunity to tell my story to people, especially young people, and maybe possibly have an impact on some kids and help in some sort of way so that they don't go down the same path, right? Or they have the opportunity to listen to somebody who's been where they've been and can relate and, and not make some of the same decisions. And so um, I, I'm not exactly sure the, the exact day, right? But the, the, the switch flipped. Um, I went back to school um, and it's funny, I, you know, I dropped out of college and then my wife and I moved in together um, 2008-ish. Right. And, and she was a teacher at that time. And, and so I quit my job. Um, I invested in this coaching thing and I invested in myself and my education. So we were living off of her salary, which was a first year teacher in Paris. Well, I don't know, 30 grand. Right. And so uh-huh. um, got married, we got married in 2010. Um, still kind of pushing along on that one salary, man, just just hoping. Right. Just hoping that it's all going to work out and, and crunching pennies. And then she got pregnant. It's like, oh, right. That's that was a great idea, right? So here we are, right? <laughs> Living off the one salary. Now I got a baby on the way. I'm chasing this dream um, at the time, right? That I thought was just a, a crapshoot, um, but I knew I needed to do something. So um, we stuck with it, and I graduated in the winter of um, 14, and I was um, a student taught at Danville High School. And, and got some coaching experience there through football. Um, and, and I actually got on the staff um, at Paris prior to that. Coached three years, three, four years at Paris, and then coached a year at Danville. And then I graduated high school in December of 14. Or sorry, graduated college <laughs> um, December of 14. And um, just by sheer, sheer luck, um, the head football coaching job at Tri-County was open, which is Oakland, Illinois, Hume, Illinois, and um, Kansas, Illinois is a three school co-op. And I thought, man, this is something that I want to do. I want to be a head coach someday. I'm just going to apply. Like, I'm just Mm -hmm. going to apply just to see what the process is, right? Just see what it feels like, just to see how all this works. Um, And so I went and applied and I dressed up nice, put my tie on and had a nice little portfolio, turned it in. Um, And the day after I applied, they called and offered me the job. And so uh, it was kind of funny because when I got offered my first job coaching, um, the guy on the other end of the phone, Adam Clapp, who was the, the principal at, at Oakland High School at the time, was elated. He's like, hey, man, you're our guy. What an amazing interview. You got exactly what we're looking for. This is what we want. We'd love to offer you the job. And my response was, I'm going to have to call you back. <laughs> He's like, wait, what do you mean? Right. And I was like, I, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this. Like, this was all just a, like a step. Right. That this uh-huh. whole application thing was a step. Like I, I, I and so he's like, hey, listen, call me back. Take your time. Um, and he said, just just know I'm going to help you. I won't let you fail. Like and he was the ex football coach at that time. And so talked to my wife. We decided to jump on it. So there it was. And, and, and so everything happened so fast after I graduated college um, and I got that first head coaching job and, and um, my first year uh coaching football failed miserably but what I had was a safety net which I had a, a wife to go home to who was a sport-minded person but we had similar interests but not only that but she was in my corner right I had somebody fighting for me 
Um, so we were able to, to sit down every night and just kind of reflect over this stuff. And then I had Adam Clapp, who was the principal and the ex-football coach. I could pick up the phone and call him. And he just understood everything and he got it. And so what I had found was I had people in my corner that were willing to help me in this, this point of transition for me, where if I fell miserably here, there's probably no more coaching ever. Mm -hmm. Like people are going to look at it and say, wow, this guy was not very good at that. Mm -hmm. He's done. Um, and we were able to push through. We were able to push through. Coached three years there. It was a wonderful place. The people I met there were phenomenal. Um, and, and we started to make an impact. And I had an amazing group of assistant coaches that bought into me and bought into my pitch of, hey, let's develop the person first. And then if we get good at football, great. Um, but let's make sure our kids, let's make sure our kids understand that we're here for them and that we love them. And let's use all of the experiences that we have as, as coaches on our staff to, to make sure that we are developing the whole person. And then we're going to get better at football. We're going to get better at football because we have better people and we have great kids and we're building this. Um, and so we, we developed that mentality as a staff and, and as a program. Um, and then three years there, I had the opportunity to kind of take a step up the ladder to a bigger school and, and applied at the Robinson job and got that. And now we're, we're four years into that. Um, and that's a lot, right? Talk, talked a long time there, but now, now we sit here as, as the head football coach of a, of a school in Illinois that's got a rich football history. Um, and, and again, man, how we got here was a whirlwind and how it all started um, even back from, you know, the fifth grade um, and before how it all started um, has just led to building blocks of, of building who I am today. Um, and, and hopefully what I stand for and that exuberates to people around me. Um, and so we get the opportunity to walk into the office every single day and make a difference. And that is something that I never, ever, ever thought um, that I would be able to do. Um, and I think that that kind of relates back to, to the whole idea of the podcast. Right. It was the struggle. Right. It was the struggle. Um, and, and finally coming to a point where you learn from it and you embrace it and you you take what you have struggled from and turn it into something positive. And now we get the opportunity to take that positive, not just for myself, but hopefully, hopefully help some kids along the way. Yeah. yeah. So. That's exactly what I wanted, you know, those stories to be told. And it's just so <clears throat> amazing. And you know, like I had goosebumps multiple times, because even though it's just amazing how different people's stories are in like, and in, in a lifetime, you know, like to hear from, Haiti and just uh, everything like a whole lifetime and to hear everyone's different stories like I I take a lot of honor in being able to hear it but like so happy for people like at the beginning I have to take notes that way I remember to come back to it but it's amazing right. how you were talking about you know like as you sit here and you reflect as a, a grown man which is so weird because like you know like we seen each other at 19. So now like you're a grown yeah. man now. Yeah. And, and, and like for you to sit there and reflect back and be able to own it and like, just give it its space of sit, sitting there saying, you know, like, um, I was being able to identify, like you were lacking in the relationships. You wanted the team, you wanted that. And to see that now and you can reflect on that but you know if we rolled up on you when you were 18 years old you would have been you know Casey Pinnell like yeah I got my own place yeah right. you know like and yes. so to see that you I mean at 18 clearly like we weren't there to be like no oh you know like I'm just chasing chasing a team over here you know like we and it's and it's also really really flabbergasting it's really interesting to hear like people in the way that they cope when they come back and the different reasons that they cope with it, yours is like the first time that I've heard so like usually you know I've heard um not usually but some people have said like they coped in these certain ways to be numb to like not have to deal with what was buried and that they didn't want to bring up and it's interesting to me that like you coped like that trying to seek those that acceptance like and I can that's I I'm glad you shared that perspective because I'm sure you're not the only one for someone to hear it and be like yeah that's exactly what I did too like it it's really powerful and then uh 
So when you were talking, uh, I loved how you said, and it's clear that like you're very passionate and your mission is to like have an effect on people, which is beautiful because like, even if you just, I loved how you said you guys are focusing on the whole, the whole person, the whole chat, the whole kid on your team, the whole person. And I love that you have all your coaches that are on the same page because you're right in the end, you're going to get better at football because first you start yeah. here. And I, right. I love that very much. Yeah. And, and yes. so like, if you even, for me, I always think like, you know, before I wrote my book, I thought like, if it just helps one person, one person, so one worth person. it. And, yep. and I think back to, you know, even though you were in your younger adulthood, Creighton Tar, you know, like giving, being like, okay, you can come help me. Like he doesn't realize how like that acceptance to be like, yeah, come help me was this, the shift in your thinking, your, your path. And it was really strong when you said as with your wife, like that you had someone in your corner fighting for you. And I hope that everybody could have someone in their corner fighting for you. Even when you don't, you just don't have it in you to fight and you just want to give up. So that was some powerful things that I'll take away from. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's, I think it's true. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think, and obviously my, my, my bring up was different, right? My walk of life was different. Um, how I was raised was different, but you see a lot of successful people that have a million different stories. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me was that what I never really understood was that there was always someone, there was always someone there that wanted to help. me, And I always looked through those people. Um, and I think we all have that genuinely, whether it's a, a teacher or a coach or a family member or just a community member or somebody that you go with at church or something. I think we all have that one person. Um, mm -hmm. We just don't seek them out, right? Or we don't notice when they're standing right next to us because we can't get past our own blinders. And I mean, I had that my whole life and I just never knew it. And so um, I had all of these events that happened in life and my responses were always selfish, right? They were always back to me. And, and how do I get a gain from this? Or how do I find what it is that I'm looking for out of this e event? And I never really took the time until way later on in life to look at the events and not think of, you know, how do I get something from this? But rather, how do I take a little piece of that and build from it? Who else, who else was affected by that event? How did my response dictate the outcome of that event? And what can I do to repair that relationship? Maybe that I necessarily ruined by being selfish. Who was there trying to help me during this? Um, and then how do I embrace my time into people that are investing their time into me? Um, and and that, that was something that I always missed. And I think that was the, you know, coming back from overseas. I think that was just, it was just selfishness, man. I just was always looking for how, how, how does, how is this good for me? How is this good for me? Like, I, mm -hmm. and I really cared about anybody else. Um, and I don't know, um, I'm sure that this may be a common feel, but like when I got back from overseas, I thought people owed me something. I thought I'd done something special and I thought people owed me something. So like, man, I, you know, I'd go out drinking all night and hop behind the vehicle of a car because I didn't care. You didn't pull me over. Like I did something special. Do you know who I am? Right. And, and mm -hmm. so I, do whatever I wanted I could do whatever I wanted because I was selfish right and I never I never really understood the big picture um and the big picture is hard the big picture is hard right when yeah. you, especially when you're young especially when you're going through major life events the big picture is really hard to get um it's really hard to get outside of your own blinders um mm -hmm. and it took me a long time a long time to to learn that um, and yeah, I mean, there's just little stuff along the way. Like I know you mentioned Creighton and, and that was a great, that was a great asset for me. Just a guy who said, yeah, come on, come throw some BP. You can throw BP, right? You may not know nothing about baseball, but you can go throw baseballs to kids and let them hit it. And just letting me be a part of it in some aspect and just slowly start to understand that it's not just about me. There's a big picture here. There's a big picture. Um, and, and so, man, we, we, we preach that all the time to our kids now, um, at, at football is just, 
<laughs> get outside your own head, right? Like you got to focus on yourself, right? You got to make sure you're taking care of yourself. And we use the acronym all the time about when you're in an airplane, right? And, and the, the air mask come down, you got to put yourself, you got to put your mask on first before you can help anybody else around you, mm -hmm. right? But the goal is to put your mask on first and then help those around you, right? right? Don't just put your own mask on and call that it, right? There's somebody sitting next to you that needs help, right? Somebody sitting next to you that's counting on you just like at some point in your life, there was that person. There was that person that was there to help you. Maybe you didn't see it. Maybe you didn't notice it. But um, I needed help along the way. And I mean, I found that. I found that in Creighton. And I found that in my wife. And now, I mean, we're married and got three beautiful kids. And, um, you know, we're growing. We're growing. And, mm -hmm. and it's, but it is. It's been the struggle, right? And, and helping from other people um, along the way. It's just, it's, you miss that when you're young. And you miss that through a, through a lot of things. Um, and it's just a mentality, right? It's just the way you operate. It's the way you go about life and how you respond to events. Um, that's one of my favorite sayings of all time is the event plus your response equals the outcome. And that's it always. You can never control the event, but you can always control how you respond to it. That's and a lot such, of times that'll dictate, that'll dictate the outcome. That's right? definitely like the perfect message to send, to send listeners. You know, I, I really want people to not just hear you know stories to get insight and enlightenment and learn you know about um okay what am i trying to say to get enlightenment about people's lives and uh maybe they'll be able to relate it and help someone in their life and i also hope that people will take away hope from it but that right there like there might be people listening to it that are still in a place where we both have been and it's like selfish and it's like why why poor piffle me people yes. owe me something and that's a tough pill to swallow but you need yes. to like being able that right there when you said like an ev event plus a response equals an outcome that's right. E plus yeah. R equals O. That's right. Yeah. Like that's yep. some people really need to hear that. Like you're going to have to, you're going to have to do the work yourself. No one's going to do it for you. That's right. And stuff's going to happen. Right? It is. You, you can't stop stuff from happening. Um, but you can always kind of control how you, how you view, view the event. Right. And, and where we're going to go from here. Um, and it is, man. I, I know you said it earlier. You help one person, you're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and no matter what it is, if it's telling your story, right, or, or you're a coach or you do whatever, do whatever, whatever it is that you do. Um, sometimes if you just take a second to reach outside your blinders and, and help one person, man, it's a big deal. Absolutely. It's a big deal, especially today. I mean, the world's a crazy place. The world is a crazy place now, man. It's a mess, right? Un understatement mess. People, of the deck. Right. People need each other now more than ever. Um, and just with everything that's going on and you see so much hate in the world. And it's not that hard to be nice and it's mm -hmm. not that hard, not that hard to just, just be nice. Um, and so, man, we, we need each other. The world needs each other. And, and, uh, man, I hope, I hope someday we get back to that. Right. I don't think it's too far away, but, um, we need that. We need each other right now more yeah, than ever. I agree. It's, yep. uh, it's really cool to see that, um, looking back on things, I think it was probably, I don't know, sometime in like the last five six maybe more than that years like I remember taking a class for my master's degree and like hearing this voice and like looking up and boom there you are right, right like, yeah. and I was like what so it's really hey, cool you. to know like at that you know super cool to see you and of course like I I have such a strong love for all my battle buddies so it's like so exciting when I get to see one of them randomly in public but to, sure. know, to know now that like you're you know like how you got there sitting there just like me like it was a struggle and you had to make a decision and boom there I saw you in there and now and now you're on this podcast telling me even more about it so that's good I know I know. Gosh, we well, and it takes <laughs> me back to <laughs> it takes me back to what you said about like um I don't remember the exact words, but like people that, um, have a, and I'm, and again, it's not the correct exact words that you had said, like people who have like done like big things and, and, um, have made a big impact or just whatever that they had a lifetime of struggle. And so it, it just leads me back to what I've kind of learned through conversations, but then also 
some like reading and research about like how some of the most strongest like in touch self-reflective people have been through a lifetime of struggles and and have been able to get that finer sweeter appreciation for life yeah with that being oh go ahead yeah go ahead no go ahead I was gonna say so with that being said like clearly you are a different Pinnell than I remembered but amazing clearly and um you're clearly now seeing the big picture you know I mean I didn't no selfish Pinnell. I mean, I guess I did, but I didn't, I didn't get that vibe from you, but you also didn't think, no, that the hot mess that I actually was at 19. So anyways, I'm think I'm rambling now, but I was going to say that now that you're a grown man style and you see the big picture clearly, like, what do you see from here? Like you're clearly having a huge impact being able to reach the lives of all these kids but then on top of that the adults that like you're being a great mentor and just friend like someone needs you to help you with your mindset and whatnot so where do you um what do you see from here like if money and resources like weren't an option at all like what kind of impact would you love to but you're clearly, again, that's a hard question because you're clearly already rocking it. Uh, well, uh, first off, uh, let's make sure and make this perfectly clear. I am still a work in progress. So um, what I am, what I am, yeah, right, what, whatever it is that I am, am rocking um, or, 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 or doing that's positive. Um, growth you're rocking is, growth yes it's still we right we, we're the the box is is always growing right always green and growing never red and ripe still trying to figure this thing out on a day-to-day basis and um you know un, the, the unfortunate yet also positive um thing for me is um and i'm sure the the world is like this um i you know i've i've had the i learned by failing um, and, mm-hmm. you know, without the without the the parental support and all that stuff that that maybe I lacked growing up, um, I had to make mistakes. And then I had to think to myself, yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and that's an unfortunate way to learn because it's a slow cooker process and it's not something that you can microwave. Like there is no microwave of maturation. It is a slow cooker process um, and it takes time. And, and so we learn by failing. And so um, while while we're getting better right? We're still a work in progress. Um, and we're still having to learn it every day by making mistakes. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, big picture, you know, what, what, where do we go from here? Right. Where, where do we see ourselves going? Um, to answer that question is I'm going to get through, um, I think it's Monday. I'm going to get through Monday. Right. <laughs> and then I'll wake up tomorrow and I'm going to get through Tuesday. And, and that is, that is kind of the way that I'm going to continue to approach it. Um, And the deal is, is if I go to sleep on Monday night and we haven't done something to get better, then we failed Monday. Right. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, whatever that is, whether, um, you know, from the football side of things, I always try to take um, about an hour every night and just work on my craft, whether it's just watching some goofy YouTube videos of somebody that runs similar offensive schemes that we do to see how we can get better at football. Right. Or whether it's reading a book um, for an hour um, about philosophies of coaching something right catching an article on twitter and just kind of diving down that rabbit hole and spending time with people that do the same thing that i do through social media whatever it is right it just continue to get better every single day um and and so um the one thing with me and the through the struggles um that i discussed earlier is i have a hard time maybe visualizing 10 years down the road um everything up until this point has been a fight. Like we're tooth and nailing up to this. Right. Like I've, I've you know, paid for my own college, right? Like we've, we've, we've done all this um, kind of through myself. Like we just bought a new house. Like I said, we're married, got three kids, beautiful wife, beautiful family. Like all of that is day by day. And it's just, everything mm-hmm. is a fight every single day. So I have a hard time visually 10 years from now. Um, so, so, so what I do um, and, and I guess to answer your question, um, if money is not an option, um, I want to do what I do. 
like this, I have my dream job and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a head football coach of a, of a great school and great community. Um, like I said, beautiful family. Um, I just finished my master's degree in educational leadership. So, you know, I've started to think a little bit about moving forward in, in educational administration. Um, but I don't want to give up my day to day job and being able to be around the sport and be around the kids and having the opportunity to walk into the school every single day and see the same kids and give them hugs. Yeah. And, and one we do every single day after practice is, is I shake all of our kids' hands. And if you ever come to a practice or a game or something like that, it may look kind of goofy, but our kids get in a line and we shake hands. And I tell them all the time, this is not you shaking my hand as your coach. This is me as a coach shaking your hand saying, thank you for being a part of what we're doing here. So I shake their hands every single day after practice. And it's not them shaking mine. And so we make that perfectly clear. And as far as big picture goes and long term and money and what all that, that's it for me. I just want to continue to be able to try to make an impact. I want to be able to give back all the struggles that I went through, mm -hmm. all the lessons that I've learned and just try to make it and make a difference. Um, obviously we're continuing education wise. Um, just finished up my master's. Like I said, we'll probably go back to school and do something else, get another mm -hmm. extra letters next to my name or something. Um, but may, you know, maybe, maybe the administration side of things someday. Um, but I mean, I really can't stress it enough. I love what I do um, and I'm fortunate to be where I'm at. And it's just been through luck and, and trials and just being at the right place at the right time. And a lot of this stuff has happened, but we'll take it. And now the opportunity is here and I got it. And I just want to get through every single day and try to be better yeah. and try to do something different. And and so I, I don't know, man, I don't know what's going to happen. I think it was a now. perfect right? answer. <laughs> It was I have a no perfect, idea. I have a perfect hard time, answer. I have a hard time visualizing 10 years down the road because Monday is a struggle. And so. honestly, <laughs> like, um, it's been a, like that question asking all my guests it. I have questioned whether I should even continue asking it because I also don't want people to get the message of like, okay, well, you know, you've done great up to this point, but now what are you going to do? You know, I don't want it to yeah. send that kind of message. No. Um, I just I didn't get that message at all. Good. I mean, think growth, growth, growth is important, right? You don't want to get stagnant where you're at. You don't want to be happy where you're at. You always want to shoot for something better, right? And but it's it's hard to visualize what better is. What's that look like? And sometimes yeah. you may be chasing a job, and then when you get it, you're like, man, that that this is not that cool. And but <laughs> like, I, I love that, that you answered like that because like again, like there's gonna be people listening that feel that same way, like what like I'm the big picture is waking up and going and doing what I love yep. and coming back to the family I love and so it was a perfect answer and you kind of already gave us some insight to this earlier I've been asking all my guests to kind of give us an idea of what you do for like your self-care time, like Casey Pinnell, like clearly you don't grow into someone that has an awesome mindset like this by just like, you know, doing lame things to feed your time and brain. So like the time you take for yourself, um, other than, I mean, even you're studying your craft at night, like, do you do that more like as a task or is it kind of self-care for you as well? Yeah. I mean, I think both, I think both, I mean, in, in a sense, it's my job. Um, but in another sense, I like it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, I think that there is joy in doing the things you love. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah, both. Right. So it's, 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 it's growth in, in my career and it's also growth in me as a person and I enjoy it. Um, and again, I mean, a lot of my time is spent, um, I mean, self-care for me is, is, you know, I do have three kids, um, and a wife. And so a lot of my self-care is, you know, I'm really super busy investing my time into all of these other kids. And sometimes in doing that, that, that lifestyle, there is a lot of intrinsic rewards in helping other people, but I still have a family at home that needs me. Um, and I know like, especially during the grind of the football season, um, I can get into habits to where that kind of gets pushed to the side because I'm focused on this one thing. And so when you're spending a lot of time with other people's kids, um, you know, that's the justification of coaching is now you're diluting the time with your own family. You're diluting mm -hmm. the time with kids. And so while you may be making an impact in everybody else's life, you've got your own kiddos and your own wife at home that needs you. Um, and so for me, um, finding that time to give back to them 
is is also is also self care, right? I mean, and that's 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 how I have to continue to to thought process is I got to make sure that our our house is in order, right? And and again, um, my wife is my rock, right? So like she's a single mom during football season, and so um, that self care is also making sure that I come home to a happy wife mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and right. happy, right? So. So um, that's that's important. That's important to me is the family aspect of, of being able to go home and spend time with my kids. And, and you know, normally the extra um, of working on on my job and my career is is after they go to bed. Right. And, and so um, I do a lot of self-reflecting, too. Um, that's good. And yeah, it is. Um, and, and I've been my 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 biggest critic. And so my worry is, is, is since I've done a lot of this, I'm using air quotes here, right. Cause that kind of going against what I said earlier, but I've done a lot of this on my own, right. Le learning through failure. Um, I'm scared to fail. Right. And so it's a huge, it's a huge fear and I'm scared to fail as a father and I'm scared to fail as a husband and I'm scared to fail as a coach and I'm scared to fail as a, as a administrator and I'm scared to fail as a teacher. And so, um, that is a driving force. Um, to continue to get better. Um, and you can't forget, and this kind of goes back to what you said earlier, um, chasing dreams is great, but you can't lose track of the successes you already had, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the, one of the, one of a uh, coach that I listened to at a clinic one time used the same big time is where you're at. And that's always resonated with me that, yeah, it's great to chase dreams. And it's great to have goals. And you always want to consistently climb up the ladder. But don't forget how cool it is to be where you're freaking at. How, oh, special it is. how special it is to, to, to know where you've come from, know where you're at and to know how you got here, because that's cool. Right. That's cool. So those goals that you may have, great, chase them. Right. But don't forget, big time is where you're at. And so um, that to me is my self-care, right, is just to mm -hmm. embrace how cool it is that we have what we have and and how how great it is that I've got a wife and great kids and how great it is that I've got this career and don't lose focus on the now. Right. Don't lose focus on just big time is right here, right now. And, and don't lose track of this moment because you and I both know it as we've seen it with our battle buddies and, and as people who even haven't been overseas have seen with family members and stuff. And especially with the COVID pandemic and everything else, things change in an instant. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you take today for granted, you're going to lose it. Right. And you're going to miss mm -hmm. it when it's gone. So um, self-care right and, and just constantly that stuff to me is just being involved in the moment right embracing the now mm -hmm. um and constantly constantly get being better at what present we're doing. being like yep. present yep yep absolutely yep. I think it's a big deal i think it's a big I, deal i a year and a half ago i read this awesome book called struggle well thriving in the aftermath of trauma by Ken Falk and Josh Goldberg and in there they were talking about and I just love this I take it with me and obviously tell everyone it they talk about how like the pinnacle of success is not when like you know getting to the top of the mountain and like having your dream job making all this money woo, 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 that the pinnacle of success is turning around going back down that mountain to help someone else yeah. And I love no. that clearly like you have a passion for that. And I love like right down to something that might seem so small, but for like me and knowing the impact that it can have on kids, shaking their hand, you making the effort to shake their hand and thank them every day or after practice, like something that might seem small like that to someone else, like that goes a long way and it speaks to your character and what you're trying to you know shape and mold these young minds to be to like not only to be respectful but like to honor yourself like good job coming to practice you did good yeah. you deserve that handshake like super cool well and you've been in the education field and one thing that i've learned since i've been here is is two things Number one, um, especially with everything that's gone down and, and I'm not getting political or nothing, but everything that's gone down with the COVID and stuff. And I saw this two years ago when we had seniors that lost their prom and lost their homecoming and lost so much. Like one, uh, the first thing that I've noticed being in the education field, dealing with kids is we adults 
currently right now cannot relate to kids. We cannot understand what they're going through because this is something that no adult has ever been through. Mm -hmm. And so we as adults are sitting back trying to tell kids what's important to them when realistically we have no idea. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. And, and so we've, we've done that in the education field where we say, hey, well, your education is the most important thing to you. Like, let's get kids back in the schools. Like, let's make sure that they're in the classrooms. When realistically, there's a lot of kids that could care less about math and reading. Like their day, right. what most might be most important to them is walking through the school building and getting to sit next to their friends and eat lunch. That may be the very most important thing to them. And, and we have, as, as adults get in the habit of telling kids what we think should be most important to them. And they are going through an experience right now that none of us will ever understand. We can't. Um, and the second thing that I've learned um, being around kids is um, and talking about struggle and staying on topic here. Struggle is perception. Right. We've got mm -hmm. kids that are driving brand new Mustangs to school, have two parents in the household, are eating whatever they want three times a day. Right. And have all the money in the world and are the most mentally depressed, upset kids that we have on our football team walk in the hallways. And like a lot of us are like, well, what's this kid got to be upset about? How does this person, how, why is this person upset? They've got everything in, in, on earth. And what we don't understand is the struggle is a perception and how you perceive citric, certain situations um, is, is what makes it hard for you, right? Mm -hmm. And just because you have everything, right? At your fingertips and everything's given to you on a, on a silver platter doesn't mean you don't have your struggles. And I am in no position to tell you that that's not a struggle for you. And, mm -hmm. and so um, that goes back to, to the handshaking thing. And I try, to, I try to always keep that in mind is struggle is a perception. Hard is a perception. What is hard is, is how you perceive it. Um, and so my hard and what I think should be hard may not be what you think should be hard, right? Or what your struggle is. And so I try to keep that in mind as an adult working with kids is, man, sometimes, sometimes kids have got it all need a hug. Mm -hmm. sometimes kids has got it all need it need a handshake and say hey thanks for being you thanks for being here thanks for being a part of this um and so i i try to reflect that um because i know i know that that what i perceive is different um than a lot of other kids and, and the education world is a different beast now too and man we just whatever we can do for kids nowadays kids especially because they're going through stuff that we've never experienced ever ever i mean they have a mask on every day at school our kids do i know a lot of kids a lot of places don't but I don't know what that's like. I mean, I wear a mask every single day, but I'm also almost 40 and have lived a thousand lives, right? So it doesn't really affect me that much. But whenever I watch my nine-year-old kid get out of the truck and say, oh, we're going to Walmart, I got to put my mask on. I never even processed that. Yeah, I never mm -hmm. even processed that. That's, that's something I never even processed. And not right or wrong, right? Not getting political, but that's a thing, right? It's a mental, it's a mental stigma for my kiddos. And, and whether it's right or wrong, I have to embrace that that may be something that's perceived as a struggle for that kid. And I, I mm -hmm. need to be there. The handshake and the least I can do, then let's shake hands. Right. And, right. and I, we as adults, um, more than anything, um, investing in our youth and, and what they're going through now is a big deal. And, and just however it is, however we can. And we, I mean, not that adults still need help, too. Right. <laughs> There's plenty of cats out there, too. Right. But um, for me and where my position is currently and where I'm at right now, that's that's my opportunity is to hopefully just be there. Right. And just help in whatever whatever fast we can and not lose track that the struggle is a perception. And, and what yeah. one, one, one person thinks is tough, another person may not. And that doesn't mean yeah. that it's any tough for that person. So. Absolutely. All good stuff. Yeah. Well, if I was right there with you right now, I would shake your hand and tell you, thanks for being you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being hey. present. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I've never podcasted before. This is amazing. Well, now you have. That's right. Check it off the list. Oh Check yeah. The list. Yeah. Well, you, in the show notes, maybe we should blast like your, um, uh, like, uh, I don't know, whatever. If you have a uh, support group for it, not support group, fan club for your football team, or I don't know, whatever you want to put in the show notes to um, give any more uh, on who Casey and the handshake is every day, you can let me know and we'll put it in there. But thank um, you. I really, yeah, I really don't have anything special to promote um, other than the fact that. Uh, um, it's cool to sit down and chat with a battle buddy. And I think what you're doing is awesome. Yeah, I think what you're doing is awesome. Um, and, and again, 
I've, I've hung out with me before and it's not that special. So the fact that other people want to invite me <laughs> on and, and talk, and I, and I know that you've gone through your struggles too. And hopefully, hopefully when this thing goes out, man, we help one person, right? Between Absolutely. You and I, right? Let's, let's, let's make a difference one time. And so I, I, appreciate, I appreciate what you're doing. And I, I'm just, I'm just thankful to be here. Um, I got nothing to plug. I got, I got nothing to plug. I did. Watch, I, I don't want to have that either. Yeah. Right. Go, watch the what's your mascot? What's the mascot? So, we're the Maroons. Robinson Maroons. I'm, I'm not oh, 100% sure what yeah. the Maroons are, but. Um, I know. It sounds really intimidating though. Well, um, <laughs> it is what it is. If you're scared of colors. If you're scared of colors, we will, we will, we will, we will petrify you. No, but well, Casey, I mean, hey. Come, come to so football much. games if you're loud, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. wear maroon. That's right. Wear That's maroon. Right. Well, right. thanks for coming on the show and getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and sharing. Honored. Sharing, Absolutely honored uh, to be here. Inspiration. Thank, thanks for what you're doing. Thank I you. Keep it up.